Okay, welcome back. After the break, uh, we will look at chapter 5 now. Okay, before the break, we were looking at chapter 4. Uh, we now look at chapter 5. Uh, before we look and study chapter 5, um, you know, we'll divide this chapter into six sections, uh, you know, based on what is being addressed by Paul to Timothy. Uh, so the six sections are verses 1 to 3, where he's talking about relationships um, within the church. In verses 7, oh, sorry, verses 4 to 8, he's talking about believers' responsibility to their own family. Verses 9 to 16, the church's responsibility towards widows. In verses 17 to 20, he's talking about how uh, to lead spiritual leaders. And verses 21 to 23, he's giving uh, Timothy's spiritual notes to a spiritual leader. And verses 24 to 25, uh, the outcomes. Okay, so we're just dividing this entire uh, section or this uh, chapter uh, into six uh, sections so that we can be able to study it uh, easily. Okay, the first one is verses uh, 1 to 3 where Paul is talking to Timothy or telling Timothy or writing to Timothy about relationships uh, within the church. So can somebody read 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses 1 to Two and three, please. First Timothy chapter five, verses one, two, three. Can somebody read that? Anyone can read verses one, two, and three? Do not rebuke an older man but exhort him as father, younger man as a brother, older woman as mothers, younger woman as sister, o older young older woman as mother, younger woman as sister, with all purity. Honor, uh, honor widows, how are really widows? Thank you, Prince. So here we see Paul is giving instructions to Timothy, to young Timothy, how to relate uh, uh, to people of different ages, uh, even as he leads them spiritually. So he's saying in the house of God, we need to honor all people. Uh, we need to honor everyone. And how do we honor uh, people in specific age groups, people who are older? Uh, honor older people and treat them as fathers and mothers. Honor younger people and treat them as brothers and sisters. And he says, honor uh, widows. Okay. And then he's uh, giving them, and he's giving him instruction says, do not rebuke an older man. Now, the, ter the Greek word for rebuke. Uh, is not the normal word we use for rebuke in the New Testament. Uh, this word rebuke here mentioned is the only place that it is used, and it literally means to strike at. So Timothy was told not to attack, you know, older men uh, with words, but to treat them with respect, as he would treat a younger man with respect. Uh, you know, and he would treat them as brothers. So also treat older uh, men with honor and with respect. Now, why is he telling Timothy about this? It's because it's in continuation of what we we saw in uh, chapter four. And as I mentioned last class, you know, this is for us, it is divided into chapter wise. But uh, for Timothy, it was a letter. Okay. So in the previous paragraph, so to say in the letter, he's talking about uh, people, uh, you know, who are false teachers, who are, their consciences are seared, uh, you know, and they're teaching false uh, doctrines, false truths. And some of them are leaders and some of them are older people in the house of God. So, you know, Paul is moving on to tell Timothy, you know, treat all of them with honor, whether they are older younger or even widows treat everyone with 
uh, honor in the house of God. So also we learn that in the house of God, we need to treat uh, uh, everyone. We can apply these instructions for ourselves. You know, we need to treat one another with honor in the house of God. Uh, and even as we, um, you know, live in our families, we need to treat people with honor. Then the second section is verses 4 to 8, where he's talking about believers' responsibilities towards their own family. Verses 4 to 8. Can somebody read verses 4 to 8, please, quickly? I'll read. Yeah, thanks, Kanan. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show pity at home and to repay their parents. For this is good and acceptable before God. Now she who is really a widow and left alone, trust in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. And these things command that they may be blameless. But if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and it <clears throat> and is worse than an unbeliever. Okay. Thank you, Kanan. So he's talking here about believers' responsibility towards their own um, family. And Paul is instructing what, uh, you know, how uh, believers must take care of, um, uh, you know, their family members who are widowed. Uh, and also talking about the local church, how they need to take care of widows, okay? So uh, Paul is saying if, uh, you know, if widows, uh, people who are widowed, um, uh, if they have children, if they have grandchildren, then the children and grandchildren must rise up to the occasion of taking care or addressing the needs of their parents or grandparents who are uh, widowed, okay? And he's saying by doing so, you know, the children or grandchildren are showing their faith in God in action and their piety by taking care of older people in the house. And he says, don't expect the church to take care of them. Uh, church will take care of widows who have no one, you know, uh, to take care of them. If they don't have children, if they don't have any uh, family there, then the church will take care. But if the uh, if the uh, a widowed person has children or grandchildren, then let them not burden the church by letting them take care of their widowed parents or grandparents, but it's a responsibility of the children and the grandchildren. And when they do it, he's saying, you know, they show faith, they show piety at home. And uh, something that he mentions here is he's saying this is good and acceptable before God. Okay, that means God is pleased with this, uh, you know, when we take care of our parents, when we take care of our grandparents, when we take care of widowed people in our family, you know, uh, God is very, very pleased with uh, this. Then Paul goes on to talk about in verse 5, he's giving a description of who really a widow is okay so a widow is he's saying is somebody who's first of all left alone okay has nobody and uh, who trusts in god and um, is not just spending her time going around and gossiping and talking and creating confusion but somebody who's spending her time or his time in supplications and prayer day and night okay so, uh, so this is who a widow is. And he says a widow should be somebody who's really spending time in prayer and uh, supplication. And in verse 7, Paul is encouraging Timothy to provide these instructions to the local church. The Message Bible says, so that they will do the right thing in their extended family. So Paul is telling Timothy, please teach all of these things in the church so that people will know what are the responsibilities they need to shoulder at home uh, and in their family life. Teach them so that, you know, teach them all of these things so that they can be blameless, so that they can be do the right things in the eyes of God. They can be right in the eyes of God and they can uh, live right uh, before the 
Lord. So here also we learn that we cannot separate our faith from our the responsibility that we have towards our family. And Paul says if we do that, if we separate our faith and we separate our responsibilities towards our family, then we are worse than an unbeliever. That's what he says, okay, in, um, says this in um, verse 8, the last uh, phrase. He says, you know, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Okay, so we cannot separate our faith uh, in God from our responsibility towards our family. If we do that, we're worse than an unbeliever. Uh, we need to be careful that our faith does not, you know, become an excuse or a reason for us to abandon our responsibility towards our family. So what do I mean? Saying that, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, God has called me as a missionary, as an evangelist, uh, you know, so I can't go back and take care of my parents who are unwell, who are sick. I can't support them. Uh, and all of those things we can do to the extent that, you know, God has provided for us. Uh, God has made way for us, but it's our responsibility to take care of our uh, family. And we cannot make excuses based on our faith uh, and uh, and because of that, we cannot abandon our responsibility towards our uh, family. So he, Paul says, if we run away from that responsibility, then we are worse than an unbeliever. Okay. And we see in verse 8, he puts the responsibility on the believer to provide for his own household and not just leave it to the church to take care of the widows. Okay. We'll move on to the next third section, verses 9 to 16, where Paul is talking about the church's responsibility towards the widows. So can somebody read verses 9 to 16, please? Do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number, and not unless she has been the wife of one man will report it for good works. If she has brought up children, she, if she has loved strangers, if she has washed and sense feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has really diligently followed every good work, but refuse the younger widow, for when they have begun to grow one, one tone against Christ, they desire to marry, having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith, and besides they learn to be a idol, wandering about from house to house, and not only idol, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things, which they out not. Therefore, I desire that the younger widow marry, bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some have already turned aside after Satan. If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them. And do not let them let the church be burdened. That if may relieve those who are really widows. Thank you. So Paul has mentioned in the preceding verses, you know, that family uh, has to the family responsibility towards uh, their, uh, you know. Uh, to, towards those who are widowed to take care of them because that is what is good, acceptable and pleasing in God's sight. And then he goes on to talk about, you know, it's also the church's responsibility to take care of the widows. And before he talks about what the church has to do and who he has, to, what they, how they have to take care of the widows, he's talking about who qualifies to be a widow. So a widow is somebody who's 60 years and older uh, she should have been the wife of one man, you know, she should have, um, uh, you know, uh, served the church um, and also she should have brought up her children well, she should have done good works, how, what are the good works, you know, uh, 
uh, entertaining strangers in their house, showing hospitality to people who come to their house, you know, um, uh, you know, taking care of other believers, saints is basically believers, you know, uh, uh, having fellowship with them, uh, taking care of them. Uh, so he says, you know, such kind of widows who've been very diligent in doing good work, those are the widows that the church can uh, take care of, okay? Um, and then he's like talking about younger widows. He says it's uh, better for them, you know, if they get married because uh, if they are just left by themselves, they'll get into a lot of unnecessary things. So he says, let them get, let them marry again, let them have their children, and let them, uh, you know, spend their time managing their own households uh, and so that they can move forward in life. If not, they will get into all wrong things, you know, just being uh, idle can lead them to gossiping, uh, you know, talking bad about people, going from house to house, gossiping, creating a lot of confusion. Um, so, you know, and uh, it will eventually there will be easy prey for, uh, you know, uh, false teachers, false doctrines, and they will move away from their faith. So he says, you know, uh, let the young women, uh, widows, uh, remarry. And he's talking here, uh, you know, he's saying that, um, you know, when they do this, you know, it will not give an opportunity to the ad uh, advisory to speak reproachfully. Okay, so those who, uh, you know, are... Uh, leaders or elders in the church or other women, other men to speak bad about them and cause confusion in the church. So better they get um, married. And also, you know, he says, for some have already turned aside to Satan. Some of these widows who had uh, no nothing to do, just idling, sitting around, they're such prey to all these false teachers, false um, uh, doctrines that, you know, Satan has uh, kind of taken opportunity of uh, of the situation and they have been led aside led away from the truth and now they are away from the truth or away from the church so he says let them uh, marry have their children and take care of their own uh, family okay but he says you know the church will take care of these older widows but if they uh, these widows have um, you know, children or grandchildren who can take care of them, then let them not put the burden on the church. Let them relieve the church from the burden of taking care uh, of uh, these widows. But if they really don't have anyone, then the church will go ahead and take care of the uh, widows. Okay. Then Paul moves on to teaching uh, Timothy uh, about uh, how he as a leader uh, should lead other leaders. Now I said in the church at Ephesus there were a lot of leaders so he goes on to teach Timothy how he as a leader should uh, teach other leaders and I also mentioned to you that you know um, uh, nine years uh, before uh, Paul came back to the Ephesus and left Timothy there. He had come there nine years back and he had appointed leaders. Uh, so, and we uh, we see that Paul had ministered three years and appointed leaders over there. So now he's telling, teaching Timothy how uh, he as a leader should uh, lead other leaders in verses 17 to 20. So can somebody read verses 17 to 20, please? Somebody can read verses 17 to 20. Siddharth, can you read verses 17 to 20, please? Yeah, I'm sure. The elders who direct the affairs of the church are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, do not muzzle the ox while it is trading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it's brought by two or three witnesses. Those who sin are to be rebuked publicly, so that the others may take warning. 
Okay, thank you. So we uh, see that Paul is talking about elders here in verse 17. He says, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. Uh, we saw in chapter 3, um, Paul is talking there about spiritual leaders. And, um, you know, uh, the spiritual leaders, he calls them as elders. The word elders in the Greek is presbyter presbyteros, okay, uh, the Greek is presbyteros, as, uh, as mentioned in the early church, uh, you know, the spiritual leaders or elders were the terms given to those who were bishops, uh, presbyters, uh, elders, and they're used interchangeably to basically to refer to uh, as one who's providing spiritual leadership. So, he mentions about them in chapter 3. He calls these spiritual leaders as elders. And these elders, you know, in the early church uh, had the names like bishops, um, presbyters, or elders, basically from the Greek word presbyteros. And uh, so all of these words are used interchangeably and just can mean one simple thing, that all of them are basically people who provide spiritual leadership. Okay? So Paul uh, has... Earlier in this uh, chapter, chapter 4, he tells, um, you know, uh, how to honor people in the church. All people in the church are to be honored. He talks about giving honor to older men, older women, younger men, younger women, and widows. And now he says that those who are in spiritual leadership, uh, you know, uh, are deserving of double honor, or we need to give them uh, this uh, double honor. So he says, Paul is telling Timothy, treat uh, all people with honor, but those who are in spiritual leadership, uh, you know, are deserving of double honor. They deserve greater respect and um, regard. And in verse 18, he says, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain and the laborer is worth of his wages. So part of this includes taking care, part of this honoring or double honor for a leader is taking care of their uh, material needs as well. So those who are involved in the, uh, in the church in um, uh, preaching and teaching uh, the doctrine or uh, even serving or uh, uh, administration, you know, they need to be paid. Okay, they need their material needs need to also be taken care of. And he says, Timothy, ensure that the church takes care of the material needs of people, but also mention that those who are in leadership positions, especially those who are teaching the word of God and the doctrine, are uh, to be given double honor, which means they need to be given uh, greater respect and regard. Okay, verse 19, he says, do not receive an accusation against a leader except from two or three witnesses. So he says, uh, you know, when people bring accusations uh, to you against another spiritual leader, uh, he's saying, you know, you need, uh, just don't listen to one person, you need two or more witnesses before handling the matter, uh, before, you know, taking the matter forward, before discussing it with the person involved, you need, and before you make a decision, you need to take uh, into account uh, two or more witnesses, okay? In verse 20, he says, you know, those who are sinning, rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest may also fear. Now, it does not mean that if somebody is uh, caught up in a sin or doing anything wrong, you know, bring them up in the front of the church and then, you know, rebuke them in front of the whole church. He's here talking basically about elders. So he's talking about spiritual leaders uh, and those who are under Timothy's uh, 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 leadership. He says, if a spiritual leader is caught in a sin, you know, then what you need to do is first you need to have two or more witnesses who testify to the fact, yes, they're sinning. And once they, uh, you know, you hear it from two or three more witnesses, it's confirmed. Then, you know, you need to correct them in private, um, teach them in private, um, you know, tell them in private. But if they don't heed to that instruction, if they continue to sin, uh, they continue to, um, 
you know, um, uh, not listen and uh, get uh, more involved in the sin, then you need to rebuke it, uh, uh, you know, in front of the entire church. You know, it should become uh, where something you address in a public. Uh, and why is he saying that? It's not to put down the person who is doing it uh, so that the church can be aware that Yes, this leader is caught up in the sin. It's not something that is acceptable in the church, in the leadership, and it's not acceptable before God. And by rebuking him, people who are also involved in that sin, who are partakers of the same sin or the same, uh, you know, or doing other sins, uh, you know, will also heed, will listen, uh, and, you know, people will not be led astray by doing wrong things, and they think it's okay for them to do wrong things, uh, because when spiritual leaders are doing, we can also do it. But Paul is saying, uh, take necessary action, take necessary steps. First, get two or three witnesses, correct the person, the person continues to live in that sin, then, you know, um, address it uh, per publicly, so that all will learn and all will walk in reverence of God and none of them will be led astray by continuing to do the wrong things and, um, and spiritual leaders will not go astray. Then we move on to the next section in verses 21 to 23 where he is giving some personal notes to a spiritual leader. So can somebody read verses 21 to 23 please? Thomas, would you like to read uh, verses 21 to 23? My little issue in throat, can somebody... Oh, okay, okay Siddharth, can you well. go ahead and read please, 21 to 23? Yeah, but sure. <clears throat> I charge you in the sight of God in Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favoritism. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequently illness. Thank Should you. The whole thing? No, uh, just 23 will do. Thank you. So here Paul goes on to say in verse 21, um, you know, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice and do nothing with partiality. Okay, so it's interesting that Paul is charging or exhorting Timothy and reminding him that God, the Lord Jesus, and the elect angels are watching over him, even as, you know, uh, Timothy is uh, leading the uh, church at Ephesus. So he's saying, hey, even if I'm not there, you know, uh, there is somebody who's watching you and that is God and the elect angels, they are watching you. Uh, so do uh, whatever you do, do it without any prejudice. Um, you know, without prejudice means without prejudging, don't judge people beforehand um, and don't, you know, treat people with partiality. That means your personal preference, you know, somebody is good to you, nice to you. Uh, they're listening to your truths. They are not, uh, you know, causing any difficulty. They're not uh, uh, being a hindrance to you. Then don't treat them in one way and don't treat people who are, you know, uh, trying to make life difficult. They're not listening to the false teachers. Um, don't treat them in another in different way. So he's, th he's saying treat everyone equally. Don't show partiality. Don't show favoritism. And do uh, do nothing without prejudging or giving personal preferences to people. So everyone is to be treated equally and fairly. Uh, don't, uh, you know, uh, distinguish people based on their language, their cultural backgrounds, uh, you know, their... Um, uh, don't give preferences to people based on their social and economic status. Uh, make sure that in the church, everyone has the same opportunity. Uh, everyone is expected to live by the same standards and to carry on their responsibility. So even as Paul is writing that uh, to the church at Ephesus and to Timothy, it's also something that is a 
applicable to our life and to our church uh, today. You know, even as we um, are spiritual leaders, you know, maybe leading a youth group, children's group, worship uh, ministry, a Bible study group, um, maybe overseeing a church, we are pastors, you know, uh, don't uh, prejudge people, okay? Prejudge people in the way they dress, the the way they act, um, you know, how um, uh, their, their uh, inclination towards spiritual growth, the inclination towards you. If somebody is nice to you, they don't treat them in one way. If somebody doesn't talk to you or is, uh, you know, just kind of keeps away from you or is ca causing even some problem or difficulty or you know is gossiping about you, don't treat them in another way. So don't treat people also based on their social status, you know, because they have money, you think that, you know, they can support you, they'll give more to the church, uh, they'll give you a lot of gifts, or um, they're people from your same place, okay? Uh, also, we don't treat with favoritism and people from outside, outside other states or other countries, uh, but you know, we need to treat everyone equal in the church of God because God treats everyone equally. For God, there is no uh, Jew nor Greek, nor male nor female. All are one in his uh, sight. He's not a partial God. He doesn't show favoritism. And so we shouldn't entertain that and we shouldn't be doing that. In verse 22, he says, um, do not lay hands on anyone hastily nor share in other people's sins, but keep yourself now, it's not talking about um, laying hands on people when they are sick or going through some uh, difficulty, but he's basically talking about, you know, uh, uh, leaders here. So he's saying, you know, don't be in a haste to appoint anyone as a spiritual leader, uh, you know, or give them a title or a position uh, as soon as they become believers or they come to the church, you know, if they're very eager to serve, if they love to serve, then put them in, uh, you know, give them some roles, some responsibilities uh, and keep watching them. Okay. So if they had doing their functions, if they're doing their roles, even though it's very small, they show commitment, they show uh, passion, uh, they're sincere in what they're doing, uh, and they do it well, and they're very faithful, then go on to give them, you know, uh, a leadership role, responsibility, uh, sh give them uh, a title, a designation, and then, you know, also continue watching them and groom them to the next level okay so don't be hasty in um, putting anyone to the to the leadership position and it's it's very important for us even as uh, you know uh, some of you are in places of responsibility uh, you know when we are quick to put people in a responsible position and then if they are not doing it well, they're causing a lot of confusion and harm and problem and you have to remove them, it will cause a lot of uh, tension. It will cause a lot of unnecessary pain and um, sometimes you know, it can even the uh, church can even break into two, or the Bible study group can break into two, or uh, you know, people can be angry with you as a leader for doing things. So, you know, be very slow in uh, giving uh, titles and leadership roles to people. You know, um, uh, first watch over them, give them small responsibilities if they're faithful, sincere, uh, then give them, you know, some more uh, responsibilities. Uh, just to see how they can take on. And once you know they have the right attitude, they have the right mindset, they are following the leadership, uh, they're following things that are in place already, then you can give them a title and a, and a leadership responsibility. But even in that, you need to groom them and help them. Okay. So he's saying don't be hasty in laying on of hands or don't be hasty in making anyone or pointing anyone as a uh, leader. He also says, don't share in other people's sin, but keep yourself pure. Uh, now, this is very important. Um, you know, Paul is saying, uh, telling Timothy that there will be many people who will come and ask you advice. Okay. Uh, advice that, you know, they want to do something and 
you know, they're doing something uh, in the church or maybe uh, something in their family or uh, something in their personal lives. And they come to you and they ask you. And Paul is saying, you know, um, you tell them what they need to be doing according to the word of God, according to the standard in God's word. You tell them what they need to be doing. And, uh, you know, if, um, uh, if they don't want to heed to that, uh, and they want to go ahead and do what they want to, then release them. But make sure that you are not, you know, supporting them in their sin, supporting them in their stand, or supporting them in what is um, wrong. Okay. So he says, you keep yourself pure. And, uh, you know, don't indulge in their sins, or don't be part of what they want to uh, do. Okay. Uh, and then he says, you know, uh, don't become an accomplice in crime. That means don't take part in what wrong they have to do. You just tell them what is right and let them uh, do it. So if people are making their decision, let them make it on their own. You don't include your name. Uh, but he's telling Timothy, you always be on guard. Okay. Uh, uh, because people can also always say, you know, pastor told me this, or Timothy told me to do this, um, or this is what the direction that the pastor gave me, or my uh, teacher gave me, or my uh, Bible study uh, group leader gave me. So be very cautious, um, you know, to step away and don't indulge or be involved in doing anything that is wrong, Okay. So uh, Kiran says uh, she wants tw verse 21 to be explained again. Okay, Paul is saying here in verse 21, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice and do nothing with partiality. That means in the church, we don't prejudge people. Okay, the way they dress, the way they speak, uh, if they speak good English, the way they dress, and you think, you know, they're really educated, they're very rich, then we treat them in one way. People who are not well-dressed or, you know, uh, 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 you know, people who are simple, um, you know, we don't give them a preference, we don't treat them well. Um, we also don't, need, we shouldn't show uh, favoritism or partiality. That means favoring people from our own uh place uh, people who are our own people group, treating them one kind people, treating other people a different kind, not talking to them or not share, you know, uh, ministering to them well or not visiting them, but only visiting people who are nice to us, who give us gifts, who support our work, who talk well about us, who talk nice about us, but people who constantly question what we do, uh, people who always tell us, you know, pastor, you could have done this, you could have done it this way, we could do this, we could do that. You know, we get angry. And when we get angry, we don't want to relate with such people, we don't want to associate, we don't want to visit them, we don't want to get involved in them, we don't want to give them any leadership responsibilities. Uh, but Paul is saying, don't uh, treat anyone with prejudice or partiality. So did I answer your question? Uh, did I explain that again clearly to you, Kiran? Emily, understood. Thank okay. you. Then he goes on uh, to verse 23, where he's telling uh, Timothy, you know, uh, Timothy is having an ongoing stomach problem. So he's saying, you know, telling Timothy, no longer drink only water, but use some Eno. Okay, he's not telling him use Eno, but he's telling use some wine. You know, people have taken this and say it's okay for us to drink a little wine because it's given in the Bible. I'm not drinking too much, I'm drinking little wine. But here, Paul is mentioning wine because Timothy is having ongoing stomach issues, stomach problems. You don't know what it is. So, wine was used in Paul's time, Timothy's time, to treat. Uh, stomach ailments okay so he's saying use a little wine uh, for your stomach's sake uh, because of your frequent infirmities but if Paul was writing to us to writing to Timothy in today's time uh, in our age in our time he would have told him you know uh, you know uh, Timothy uh, you know no longer drink only water but use you know you have given some medications, use Jelusil or use uh, uh, 
you know, omeprazole, whatever we use for stomach ailments, you know, uh, he would have told him uh, that that's what we use in our country, India. So, you know, he would have mentioned it. So here it does not uh, give us license or uh, does not give us freedom to indulge in drinking alcohol or even wine because, uh, you know, Paul mentions it. It's because in Paul's time, little wine was used for stomach ailments okay and so it does not uh, understanding of this verse does not mean that uh, we can indulge in drinking alcohol yes we could use some alcohol free wines um, yeah you could use but why would you want to use it why do you want to even drink alcohol free wines because you know you're uh, when you're saying that it's okay, then it's okay. Next time you say it's okay to even drink a little wine with uh, alcohol. <laughs> you see, uh, how does addiction happen? You know, it's not that uh, people start smoking uh, uh, one pack of cigarette. It's just somebody who says, "Just hey, just try one puff." Nothing is going to happen. But that one puff, for most people, it leads to two puffs, to three puffs, to one cigarette to one package, to even five or ten packets uh, in a day, see? So why even use alcohol-free wines when you have other so many drinks that you can drink, you know, soft drinks and uh, other juices that you can drink? Why even want to use alcohol-free wines, okay? So even when we, when we partake in the Lord's communion, we're using grape juice. We're not basically using... Uh, uh, wine okay you need to be very careful about that as well because children have been led astray say it's okay because people drink wine in church during communion okay thank you for sharing a thought on that kanan okay then we move on to the last section which is talking about outcomes versus uh, 24 and 25 so can somebody read verses 20 can somebody read verses 24 and 25 please I'll read. Yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment, but those of some men uh, follow later. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those <clears throat> that are otherwise cannot be hidden. Thank you. So um, in verses 24 and 25, uh, you know, Paul uh, seems to tie back to the issue of leaders sinning. Um, in verses 19 and 20, he tells Timothy the need to keep himself away from becoming a partner in other people's wrongdoing. He mentions that in verse 22. Now he's telling Timothy that the outcome of his lifestyle will be evident, uh, you know, uh, will be seen in how he uh, lives and in this regard he's saying some people's sins are already out in the open uh, people know about it the church knows about it the leaders knows about it and uh, we will see them be judged okay but he's saying some people's sin will be ex exposed sometime later but it will be exposed so it does not mean that since their sins are not exposed nobody knows about it there'll be a time when their sin will be exposed because god says in his word your sin will find you out okay so similarly he says when people do good uh you know sometimes it's very clearly evident to others the good that they are doing uh, for others the way they're helping the church uh, the good person that they are while some people when they're doing good you know um it's hidden nobody can see it, it they do it behind the scenes but uh Paul is saying, you know, it will be rewarded. God will surely reward them. So just like people who feel that their sins are not exposed, uh, not to be happy about it and continue sinning because there'll be a time when it will be exposed, they'll be judged. Uh, just like other people's sins are exposed and they were judged. So also he says, those who are doing good, everyone who can see it will praise them. But for those of you who are doing it quietly and nobody knows about it, you know, don't uh, feel disappointed. Don't feel, um, uh, you know, discouraged. But he says, you know, God is watching. He is your 
a rewarder because um, this is what God, Jesus reminds us in Matthew chapter 10, verse 26. You know, therefore do not fear them for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Okay. So then he's telling Timothy, we all have, you know, a life to live and we have to live that right in the eyes of God, in the sight of God, live that right in the eyes and the sight of uh, believers and the world. And we also need to teach others to do right. So we live right first and then we teach others to live right. Okay. So that is the end of chapter uh four uh so what is the takeaway for this anyone knows what is our takeaway for sorry chapter five that is uh what is the takeaway for chapter five takeaway is to honor everyone okay older men older women treat them as fathers and mothers honor younger men and younger women as brothers and sisters and Sorry, those who are in spiritual leadership are, uh, you know, worthy of double honor. So that is uh, the key takeaway. Any uh, comments, any questions, any doubts you all have? Chapter 4 and Chapter 5, which we did today. Yeah, you need to take care of widows, yes. It's clear, okay. If there are no questions, any doubts, then we'll end class. Is that all right? Okay, thank you all for um, joining. Have a good day ahead, and I'll see you soon for our next class. Bye, everyone.